morning, everyone. Welcome back to our professional development series. Today, we have Mark Skipper here with us, who will be teaching you all how to talk like a CEO. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Wolf. Why, thank you, Lindsay. Thank you very much. We are truly blessed today to have someone who is a professional speaker, as well as a international Toastmasters and, and all-around great guy champion. Um, Mark, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing fantabulous, sir. I'm doing fantabulous. As you can tell, my green screen is working pretty much. I've got the Power Up IT logo popping, and life couldn't be any better with technology. So we're going to knock on wood that, you know, this world of technology keeps moving in a, in a positive direction. So, Mark, tell us a little bit about yourself and um, what you want to talk about today. Sure. So I, as you said, my, my background before I became, actually, let's go all the way back before I became a speaker. So for 25 years, I was a fundraiser and I worked with the Boy Scouts of America and Dunwoody, Dunwoody College. And what I did for them is that I will go out and I will talk to people about the organization, connect them with the things that they were interested in. And at some point, I would ask them to make a, make a financial contribution to the organization. So I really enjoyed that, enjoyed working with the people, enjoyed working with the companies that I had the opportunity to, to work with. You know, I used to always say, when I first started, I was 23, 24 years old, and I had an opportunity to meet with presidents of, of companies, of, of banks, that I know most of the people that graduated when I did, didn't have that opportunity, but being able to work with an organization like the Boy Scouts gave me that, that chance to do that. Throughout that entire period, I had an opportunity to really work on my communication skills and my, my speaking skills. And I went from being afraid of speaking to really in, enjoying it, which led me to making a decision about seven years ago that I wanted to have my own business, which I had had this desire for, for a number of years. So I started a, a cleaning business here in, in the Maple Maple Grove area. Kind of focus on real little bitty offices that, that we, we served here here in the area. So I've had got that running and last year, I'd, well actually the year before last, I decided, you know, I really would like to do what I have a real passion for. And that real passion is inspirational speaking, helping other people to overcome their speaking fears, their discomfort with speaking and helping them to be successful in, in that area. So I started taking baby steps towards being a professional speaker, which I am still in that, that process of taking those steps to, to become that. So last year, I had my first speaking in engagement. It felt great. I brought on a, uh, brought on a client who I coached, and, I, and so I started the process of finding people that needed help with their speaking and, and coaching them. And I decided, you know what, I was going to call this effort, this business I was in the process of starting, call it Speak Better Than Your CEO. And I chose that because I think most people, when they think of the presidents and the top people at these big organizations, they tend to be really good communicators. They speak very well. And in many cases, when they became president, they weren't necessarily the smartest person in that company, but they were always really good communicators. They were able to take ideas and share those with groups of people that people started to be able to buy into it and follow them. So I thought most people could relate, relate to that. And that's why I decided to call it Speak Better Than, than Your CEO. One of the things I do on a weekly basis, I put out 20 or I put out a tip every Tuesday morning on LinkedIn and Facebook, just helping people on how they can become better communicators. Since we've been doing a lot of Zoom meetings because of the whole thing with the virus and we us having to stay at, at home, they've been focusing more on what some of the things that you should do when you're on Zoom or Zoom etiquette. Things like, where do you look? You know, you have all these people's faces on the screen. Do you look at the person that's on the screen 
or do you look at the camera where that little light is up there at the front? So I'll talk about those kinds of things in, in my, my tips. So as I said, I, I love the opportunity to, to help other people to overcome their speaking challenges so that they could be successful. That's I know that was kind of long. <laughs> that was kind of long. Sorry about that. No, no, you're, that's perfect. That's, that's exactly what our students need to hear. And I think it's absolutely critical. And I love the fact that you have um, transformed that in-person speaking engagement to the virtual world, right? So regardless of COVID, right, in the pandemic, regardless of that, the students that we attempt to attract are in that STEM category. But even more specifically with Power Up IT, we, we approach technology students, right? That is, in the high school, that is really the sweet spot for Power Up IT. However, what we're finding is these virtual live sessions, once they're recorded, this information that we're providing, you know, free of charge to high schools across the state, to the students in the Twin Cities, and especially our four urban Power Up IT high schools, Harding, Humboldt, Minneapolis North, Minneapolis South, is valuable information, not just to them, but for seniors that are in high school. And you wouldn't believe the feedback that we get from collegiates and early career professionals that can leverage your experience and your mastery of the oratory, right, I'm a butcher, right, the uh, public speaking um, realm. Um, having, you know, some insight and background onto organizations that may have uh, had a great impact and sharing that information transparently is also very valuable to know that in addition to all the wonderful tips and tricks that you're going to give us today on how to be confident and you know speak like a ceo or how to be speak better than your ceo too is very valuable to all ages because even as a grown man as they say i learn every time that you speak and i hear you speak at the variety of meetings and, and your competitions that you participate in. So um, why don't you share a little bit about what what we came here to talk about then, and I'll just turn the mic right back over to you and let you let you have at it. Sure, I appreciate that. Well, one of the questions that students might be asking, why is it important for me to learn how to speak well? And let me tell you, there's a lot of value to being able to be a good communicator, communicator and a good speaker. One of the richest people in the world by the name of Warren Buffett, he's, he's a, a celebrity investor. He says, one of the ways to increase your personal value by 50% is to improve your communication skills. And think about once the time you get out of high school if you choose to go, to go to college, you get out of college, you have to get a, get a job. And one of the top things that employers look for today are applicants that have excellent communication skills. And they say that's one of the things that the vast majority of the applicants are missing because many of the schools don't do a great job of preparing kids to be good speakers and good listeners. So first of all, let me start by telling you, you don't have to be born already knowing how to speak well and feeling comfortable about speaking well. Let me give you just a little bit of background on me when it comes to speaking. I was petrified of standing up in front of people and speaking all the way through the time I got out of college. I remember being in the seventh grade. I'm sitting in class and I'm just sweating like a pig. I'm nervous, my heart is beating real fast. And why is that? Because the young lady that was standing up in front of the class was giving her presentation and the next person to do so was me. Some of you might be able to relate to that nervousness of feeling your stomach churning around and your heart beating fast. As I said, I was that way all the way through college. I got into my 20s and I was that way. And I finally made the decision, if I was going to be able to hold a good job, I was gonna to have to learn how to overcome my nervousness of speaking in front of people. 
So when I got my very first job out of college, I went to work for the Boy Scouts. And that first job, I had to stand up and speak at least two times a week in front of people. So for the first few weeks, yeah, my heart felt like it was about to explode in my chest. But I found out that the more that I did it, the more that I got up there and faced my fear, the more that I began to speak, that it got easier. The heart that was beating like this before started slowing down. And things became actually fun to stand up there and make present presentations. One of the things that I found that helped me to overcome my fear was being better prepared when it was time to speak so that I wasn't trying to figure in my mind, what's the next thing I'm going to say when I'm giving the presentation? But I spent time before that moment, that day, writing out an outline of what I was gonna say, same types of things you learn in class right now, if, you're doing a report, a book report or something of that sort, where you start off with an opening, you have a body and you have a close. I would do that with, with my presentations. And it made me feel that more at ease in making the presentations. One of the things I found out when I was working, once again, most of the people did not feel comfortable standing up and speaking in front of an audience. And that's going to be pretty common. I think you're going to find that to be the case probably while you're still here in high school, as well as when you get out and you go get your first job. A lot of people will not want to stand up and make a presentation. If you start learning now how to overcome your fear and to become comfortable with speaking, you're going to stand out significantly from other people because they aren't willing to do what you are. And that's to stand up, smile, and begin to talk. Now, there are a number of things that you can do, as I said, to overcome your, your fear. Just keep practicing. Whenever you have an opportunity, whether it's in one of your classes, when you get out and you get your, your first job, whenever they're looking for someone to give a presentation, raise your hand and volunteer to do that. It doesn't matter what it is, just the more you do it, the easier it becomes and the more comfortable you become with it. One of the things that, that I, I learned from watching other people that speak very well and going to things like trainings like Toastmasters, which helps adults to become better speakers and better listeners, I learned a number of things that will help you become a good speaker that's going to engage your audience. One of the first things is make sure that you're looking at the people that you're speaking to. Eye contact. So for instance, here on Zoom, the eye is that little light that's on my computer. And that's where I should be looking so that I'm connected with you and having a conversation directly with you as opposed to looking down to the left in this corner or looking in, in that corner. Think about how it feels when you're having a conversation with somebody and you're talking to them and they're looking down at your feet. Or if they're talking, they're never looking you in the eye, but they're looking to the left or the right or above you. So eye contact is very important, whether you're speaking one-on-one, -on -one, whether you're in an interview, or whether you're speaking to 10 people, 20 people, 100 people, is being able to have eye contact. And of course, one of the things that people always say, well, if I'm speaking to 10, 20, 30 people, how can I have eye contact with everyone? Well, here's a little secret on how you can do it. Doing this is gonna make you look like a pro the next time you have to give a presentation in your classroom. Just break the room up into three different parts. You look at the first part. You make a statement, you finish your point. Then you move to the middle. Make some more, another statement, finish your point. Then you move to the third section. 
and then you start over. And that will create a sense that you're giving people eye contact. So as I said, and what well, I guess I didn't say is just find a person in each one of those three sections and do that. So eye contact is so important. The second thing that's, that's important to really make you a good communicator and for people to stop and say, wow, that's a good speaker. Stop using what we call filler words. Those are words like, um, uh, and so the next time you're listening to someone speaking, just take a lot of pen and just tick off every time you hear them use one of those kinds of words. One thing that you will find out is that a lot of us use those kinds of filler words, which can become very distracting when you're trying to make a presentation or make a point. So, so practice, instead of saying, um, ah, all those filler words, just be quiet. Just pause. Let there be just silence, which at first is a little difficult because I think we feel uncomfortable when we're speaking of having silence. We feel like we have to be just talking nonstop. You don't. So if you use a pause, and I use the word so, if you use the word pause well, one of the purposes is to take out those filler words. Using the word pause is also to help and give people time to think about the important thing you just said. It kind of gives the mind the opportunity to let that important point you just made marinate in their mind for them just to think about it. Because if you speak too fast after you say something really important, it doesn't give them an opportunity to think about it. So the better speakers that are out there, you can be that better speaker by putting in those pauses, which eliminates, eliminates the filler words and gives people the opportunity to think about what you just said. So that was the second, second key point. Another thing that you can do that's going to help you to be a really good speaker is body language. Speaking is not just what you say, but it's your facial expressions. It's the use of your hands. If you think about when you're having a conversation, let's say with one of your friends, there's different ways to say the same thing based upon how their body reacts and how their face re re reacts. So right now I can tell you, just kind of a straight face and say, I am so excited. Am I really convincing that I'm that excited? Or if I say, man, I am excited. Isn't there a difference between the two? And the difference was what? My facial expression. It was the use of my body. It was the use of my voice, raising my voice. So your body language plays an important role in your ability to communicate with people. So learning how to do that will help you become a, a better speaker. So how, how can you learn how to do those kind of things? I would bet some of your classes, you do have the opportunity to give up and make presentations. You probably have opportunities to volunteer for different extracurriculum activities at school where you have an opportunity to stand up in front of people, great way to get the practice of speaking. If you go to, to church or synagogue or mosque, someplace to worship, many times there's an opportunity for young people to have the opportunity to speak, to take leadership roles in programs, but just taking advantage as much as, as possible of practicing standing up in front of people. And then once you turn 18, and I know all of you are getting close to that point of, of being 18 years old, there are organizations out there that will help you to become a better speaker. And one of those that I mentioned was this organization that I, I'm a part of and Dr. Wolf is a part of, 
and it's called Toastmasters. And Toastmasters gives you the opportunity to have a prepare a five to seven minute speech. You might talk about your experience in high school and you would stand up and you'd have seven minutes to give your speech. Then afterwards, someone else would stand up and then tell you the good things that you did and suggest maybe one or two things that you can do to even make it better the next time and then follow that up with some other positive things about your presentation. But that's a great organization that once you turn 18, I would highly recommend that you find one and become a, a member, member of that, that organization. But once again, good speakers, employers are looking for applicants that speak very well. And if you speak well, that opens up opportunities for you as far as promotions in your organization that you can move up. And in many cases, you're going to move up much faster than the person who might be as smart as you may even be a little bit smarter than you. But if they are not good communicators, they may not have the same opportunities that you will have. So if you take some of these things, work on these, it's really going to help you to become what I always say to people, speak better than, than your CEO. And I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Wolf. Fantastic, Mark. Thank you very much. Um, at this point in time, we will, we asked Lindsay to look at the chat board to see if there's any questions come in. But I, before we do, I actually had one question. If you could elaborate on the whole body language, because right as you said it, I had been sitting up erect, sitting attentive, trying to make sure I'm in the middle of the picture, right? Even though I, I, I realized I need to move my camera so that I, or move the screen closer, to I'm looking at the camera. That was an excellent point, is eye contact. However, I noticed as time went on, I started to lean back and I started doing things like that. And I'll swing, you know, I have a chair that, that rocks. And so what image am I portraying to the audience, right? If I'm not sitting erect and, and perpendicular to the picture. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on what you've seen? Um, I know you host a number of Zoom meetings and you do per, uh, professional development. You do um, public speaking, you know, management. Can you maybe talk just a little bit about some of those perceptions in a, you know, a little bit deeper dive on that so that, um, and I can also offer maybe some tips or tricks about, sure. yeah. Well, I think Dr. Dr. Wolf just gave us a great example. So when Dr. Wolf was close into the camera, think about what was your image of him at that moment? Most of us will look at that with him being leaned in as that he was paying attention. He was, he was listening. That was the picture that most of us would have received. When a person leans back, like he's doing right now with his hands behind his head, he may be thinking about his to-do list. He may be thinking about all the meetings that he has to prepare after this webinar. He's not paying attention to the same degree as when he's leaned in into the camera and listening. So we, we just really have to be aware what our body posture is saying, not only when we're speaking, but also when we're, when we're listening. Going back to if you're having a, person, a conversation with someone else one-on-one, -on -one, if they have their hands in their pockets and it looks like they're kicking a, a little pebble around, you don't usually feel like, wow, this person's not really paying attention to me. So we just need to be really a, a, aware of where our eyes are when we're speaking and when we're, we're listening, how we're moving our, hand, our hands. Are we leaning in? Are we sitting back? You know, that leaning in is so important, for instance, when you're in an interview. Because once again, that says, that you really are paying attention. So body, body language plays, plays a, a big role in communication. 
Absolutely. The other thing is being quick on the draw to that mute button, which sometimes I'm a little bit slow on trying to find it. <laughs> well, it helps when you're leaning forward. <laughs> it certainly does. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So there's a lot of, you know, in today's new world, right? Because a portion of this COVID induced stay at home remote worker, you know, a lot of our students are going to be going for interviews uh, virtually. And as a national officer for uh, BDPA, the National Black Data Processing Associates, we host virtual career fairs and deal with, from the classroom to the boardroom, tons of uh, young people, collegiates, uh, and so on and so forth, that are looking for hiring opportunities. And I was very fascinated when, in the early years, Google, Amazon, Microsoft started doing virtual interviews because I couldn't fathom it. How could you not shake somebody's hand, right? Or how could you not see what they're doing? But to tomorrow's or today's IT professional is going to have to do more virtual um, engagement and understand everything that you just said, Mark. They're going to need to, you know, feel as comfortable as they can with that. In addition to that, what I'm finding is that most technology-focused organizations are giving you online quizzes, right? And so the irony of this is COVID actually proliferates the skills that you're going to need anyway to survive in, in, in a job in, or a career, more importantly, a career in technology. Um, and there's going to be so many people that are going to want to hire you if you start now, if you master these communication skills, I can't, I can't reiterate and stress the importance of everything that you just shared with us, Mark, about truly being able to build that confidence, and now is the time to start building that confidence. Oh, it, 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 most, it most certainly is. This morning in another meeting, I talked about Zoom etiquette. Hmm. The things such as I, I talked about, the importance of even when you're one-to-one -one is the eye contact. So on your computer, you're in a Zoom meeting. Let's say your, your interview may be being conducted by Zoom. Look for that lit up dot on your computer. I happen to have a laptop right now, but there's a light right there. You should look into the light when, when you speak. You should smile. Because when you smile from time to time when you speak, it relaxes people. It relaxes you. It helps them to feel that you are confident when you smile. Think about when you're really scared and nervous. Most of us don't smile when we're, we're nervous. So when you smile, you look very confident. Yep, absolutely. Uh, happening here. Um, another thing with our Zoom etiquette. Think about how you're dressed. When you're on Zoom, when you're in a, in a meeting, especially when you're going on, a, on an interview, that's not the time to have on your Snoopy pajamas. You should think of dressing in a very professional manner. Just as you would if you were to go face to face with an interview, most times you would put on a suit, if you're a man, a, a suit coat and a shirt and, and a tie then that's what you should do on your, your Zoom interview as, as well. Women, um, um, very professional dress or, or um, suit is appropriate to do on Zoom. Also think about what's in your background. That's not the time to have, because right now on Zoom, you can put these virtual backgrounds on. I think Dr. Wolf, you have a virtual background on right now. That's not the time to have the beach in the background with the palm trees swaying back and forth. That's not the appropriate background to have for an interview or for a business meeting that you're, you're having. Have a background that is going to be pretty conservative. It, it might be just a, a blank wall behind you, but you want to have things behind you that's not taken away from the seriousness of of the meeting that you're that you're in. So being able to understand and how to use Zoom right now is key because the next five, 10, 15, 20 years, Zoom, these types of ways of, of meeting um, virtually 
will be more commonplace, even more so than what they are, are today. You know, I think this is really funny. I, Dr. Wolf, you may remember this. I don't know if you all have seen this cartoon called The, Jet, the Jetsons. The Jet, you're laughing because you recognize. So, so The Jetsons is a, is a cartoon that comes on the Cartoon Channel. Um, they do the reruns. Probably came out during the 60s or, or so. But this whole world, they were in outer, outer space. And so they had technology that was far ahead of what we had at the time. Well, one of the episodes that I always remember on the Jetsons is just how we are right now looking at our computer screens. Yeah. That's how they would make telephone calls. Mm -hmm. And they would have cut out pictures of themselves looking really nice in the nice clothes because in actuality, they had these big rollers and they had on the, the house coats. So the technology that we had back then has now become the actual technology of today. So take advantage of this technology today because a few years from, from now, this is not gonna be something we're just doing because of, we're, we're kind of locked in because of the virus. This is gonna be how companies are going communicating with other companies and interviews are be, being done this way. Learn how to use it so that you would be the one that's gonna stand out from all those other students that didn't take advantage of the opportunity at this time working with different technologies that are out there that is spot on that is 100 percent spot on so lindsay uh, before we wrap up uh, we'll give mark an opportunity if there's any other key points that he would like to make and then if you have any questions uh, from the chat session or any of the guests that have joined us, feel free to share those at those at this time or any questions you may personally have, Lindsay. Yeah, uh, so we have a couple questions here. The first is what questions or topics do you use to start a conversation with a stranger and what questions should you not ask? Oh, that, that's pretty good. Well, we're typically, you know, you start off by, by introducing yourself. One of the things that we know is that most people like to talk about themselves. So you ask questions, and I'm thinking now because I'm, I'm an adult, I may go to a networking event. One of the things I'll, I'll ask is, what kinds of things do you do in your job? I'll ask questions like, what is it that drew you to your particular profession? Those kinds of questions that are going to give them the opportunity to, think, to talk about themselves, to really think about how they feel about some of those questions. One of the things that I found is that I always try kind of an 80-20 rule. You ask a question and let them do 80% of the talking. They're talking about themselves. And what you're doing is you're listening and you're trying to figure out how can you help them in some way. So those types of questions that cause them, so why, I don't know, why am I in this profession? Or you ask them, what has caused you to be successful in your particular job? Once again, that's giving them an opportunity to think about themselves. Now the question is, what question do you not ask? This has been out there, I know as long as I can remember as an adult is, there are a couple of things that you tend not to talk about. One is don't bring up politics. You know, don't talk about what's happening with the president or the, the governor, the mayor, what do you think about this or, or that? Because that is one topic that people have very strong, tend to have very strong emotions about. Some people might agree with you, some people might disagree with you. So it's just best to almost not get involved in having those kind of conversations, whether it's at work, definitely not in an interview, because you just never know how strong people's feelings are about that topic. So it's just easier to just not even address that. The second one they say is talking about religion is another one. Once again, not to say that um, you personally don't have certain strong beliefs in, in, in your faith, 
But that once again it comes down one that most of us have very strong feelings about. And if you make a statement that they disagree with, it could create just unnecessary friction between you in a particular situation. So you wouldn't want to do that on a job interview. I would recommend you that you don't do that at, at work as well. So those would be the two things I would say stay away from politics and religion. What if I could do a friendly amendment sure. in much of my management training, I think, you know, politics, religion, and then gender, right? So gender, not that it, it has no place in the workplace. When I say that the conversation about gender, unless it's very specific to a pertinent issue or topic at hand, I've learned to create a better set of vocabulary using gender agnostic or type of language. So third person, they, them, right? And I know there's a big movement to identify in, a, in different ways. I've seen the she, her, hers type of shirts and all that. Um, however, I will say that one of the taboo things was to keep it equitable, keep it fair, at least in the best that we could is like, you never talk about gender unless it has something to do with it because it, it's a slippery slope. It has too many tentacles and too many bad directions. And so whatever your cultural upbringing is, gender is also another thing too, and also to be culturally aware. Because when you speak to someone, and, and Mark, you can help me here. This is just, now I'm kind of freestyling. Okay. But when I was, many years ago, uh, there was, I believe it was Japanese, potentially that they bowed when when they greeted someone right, right. So you had eye contact but then you didn't have eye contact at certain there's certain points where it's culturally socially important that you don't breach those um, when you approach a person unknown faith potentially female and they might be of a different religion you can't automatically assume you can just reach out and shake their hand However, you are entitled as a human being to make that mistake if you aren't aware, but you should never speak or act beyond that, right? So if, if I approach Lindsay and Lindsay chooses not to shake my hand, there could be many reasons, right? So in addition to your body language and all that, how you react while you're public speaking, like for example, if Mark, I'm on the call, and I'm sitting like this, and I'm listening to you attentively, and you say something that irritates the daylights out of me for whatever it might be, right? It might be something I feel passionate about, like you you happen to mention politics, and I go, and then you're sitting on a call, your facial expression, you're wiping your face, you know. These are all, fi all these signals that we're sending off to the public, to the other speaker, but I do know gender, not to, to beat that one down, but Gender is one that I've found is always in my number one, um, well, out of the three, they all rotate, but one of the top three things that I try to, to not introduce into um, speaking. You know, Dr. Wolf, you brought up something that's gonna be interesting to find out what we do going forward. Of course, with the whole thing with the, the virus now, when you just said hand handshaking, um, of whether or not that will continue to be what we typically would do is handshake or if now it's just going to be bumping elbows or if it's going to be something like bowing like the Japanese do so that we're not touching. I, I think we it's probably just going to take a few months after we're all re released from being at home for us to kind of see where we go with this, if it will be more of the traditional way of, shaking hands or or not uh, my last thing is an example that i just more or less deliberately although i am a bit parched was have you ever seen a tv show or a tv news show or an anchor and they have bottles and cups on their their desk one of the things that i found myself saying ah oh, that probably doesn't look too good on camera although i'm not doing it for the vanity of it is you should pay attention to what you're doing in the time of day. So you don't want to have 
you know, a, you know, a bottle. I'm guilty of this. I'm totally guilty. You don't have a bottle of pop sitting there drinking and <laughs> lean back and all that. Those are all the, the bad habits that you don't want to learn from me. And so, Mark, I want to take this time to thank you and turn it back over to Lindsay because she's in control of closing us out. But see if we have any more of these great questions. And whoever asked that question, that was a great question. Yeah, just uh, one more question for me personally. So, you know, I get anxiety before I have to get up and present too. And then when I get up there, I find myself rushing through what I have to present. So do you have any tips on how to try to like slow down your heart rate and slow down your uh, talk rate of talking speech? Cer certainly. Well, I, I would first say that being nervous before you stand up and speak in front of people is common. You will hear people that have spoken for years in front of hundreds and thousands of people where they will tell you when they first get up, they're a little nervous. So that's, that's okay. Typically within the first minute or so, once you start speaking, you'll calm down. So one, one of the things I, I, I would say, and this is with, as I said, with anything, the more you do something, the easier it gets, the more comfortable you become, the fear begins to go down like this, the more that you do it. Before you get up to speak, you can practice on taking deep breaths. That's one way to kind of re relax your heart rate. Some people will listen to, if they're in an environment where they can do this, they'll listen to music that relaxes them or if you're, let's say you're in a staff meeting and you can't have earphones in your ear, just mentally start thinking about music that makes you feel, feel comfortable. The more you do it, the easier it's going to get. It's okay to slow down when you feel that yourself, that you're maybe speaking too fast. Just take a deep breath and sl slow down, put pauses after some important things that you say, count to maybe two, one, two. And that's one of the ways to just kind of slow you down so that you aren't speeding through real fast. Because most of us, when we feel that very uncomfortable, you're absolutely right. You want to go fast because you want to hurry up and sit down. So just the more that you do it, consider taking deep breaths beforehand, Put some pauses in between what you say. Then just over time, it's going to be much easier and you're going to have less and less of the feeling uncomfortable. All right. Lindsay, any other questions? Do you want to bring us home? Yep, that was it on the questions uh, for today. Uh, so from Dr. Wolf and I here at Power Up IT, we would like to give a big thank you to Mark for such a great presentation. And we will see you back here on Thursday at the same time for our Thursday Tech Talk.